afternoon. My name is Essence Bennett and I have the pleasure of serving as the Student Government Association President for the 2020-2021 academic school year and I am a senior majoring in health sciences. And welcome to the How Eagle Soar Virtual College to Career Panel. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. And this event features Coppin alumni from the natural sciences and health professions sharing information, tips, and resources that help them in their respective career fields. I'll first begin by introducing, excuse me, introducing our three panelists who are joining us this evening. First, we have Mr. Andre Foster. Andre Foster, MSN, MBL, NEA, DC, FNP, CRNP, DC, is currently a family nurse practitioner, currently practicing emergency medicine, internal medicine, and primary care medicine. Andre currently practices at several safety net and un underserved community hospitals in Maryland, as well as primary care in Baltimore City, and more recently, FEMA crisis support for COVID-19 in New York, New Jersey, and Texas. Mr. Foster is a graduate of the Helene Field School of Nursing Baccalaureate Net Degree Program, Class of 20, me, 2005. He also earned a Master of Science in Family Nurse Practitioner from Coppin State University, Class of 2015, as well as earning a Master of Science in Nursing and a Master of Business Leadership from Washington Adventist University. Andre was reared in Baltimore City and was raised just moments from Coppin State University in Baltimore County. Prior to his tenure as a nurse practitioner, Andre has served his community and the needs of multiple patient populations in the capacity of director of multiple hospital service lines, including emergency, behavioral health, and med surge. He has served as the bedside in the ER, trauma, OR, and critical care settings. He has also served as a critical transport RN, transporting patients in internationally to and from the United States to a disposition in an appropriate care setting, typically from a higher level of care. Andre holds board certification as a family nurse practitioner, as well as a nurse executive advanced. Andre has a passion for community and social activism with a focus on healthcare equality, equity, is it equity and wealth attainment and equity and educational and entrepreneurial opportunities for African Americans. His vehicles for changing the dynamic of success in the African American community is the Nietzsche, Mega, excuse me if I pronounce that incorrectly, Investment Group, because of the time there. Negus. Negus. Thank you. <laughs> Negus Investment Group, LLP, and Complete Access Care, LLC, as well as multiple other small business ventures to enrich the community. He is a car enthusiast and enjoys family, travel, and sports. Next, we also have Dr. Ashley Queen joining us today. Dr. Ashley Queen is a woman ready to inspire and change the world around her. Born and raised in Maryland between the DMV and Baltimore area, she has the exposure to the unique social, political, and professional landscape of living near the nation's capital. She has a Bachelor's of Science in Biology with a minor in Chemistry from Coppin State University. She further earned a Doctor of Philosophy in Microbiology from Howard University. Dr. Queen has worked in the government, nonprofit, and academia landscape. She is a public health and regulatory professional with experience in managing programs in topical antiseptics research, biologic drug application review, pathogen surveillance, health disparities work, and in genome-wide association studies. Dr. Queen is a mentor and advocate for budding and early career scientists, always eager to support the next generation of STEM leaders. Last but not least, our third panelist is Dr. Christopher Rogers. Dr. Christopher Rogers is a health policy, pub, population health, and public health practitioner, researcher, and educator who has worked across all levels of care continuum to eliminate health disparities, increase access to health care, address social determinants of health, prevent chronic illness, and to promote self-management of chronic diseases among undeserved excuse me, underserved and vulnerable populations through research, policy, clinical integration, health promotion, population health management, program development, implementation and evaluation, project management, care coordination, 
health information technology, training and technical assistance, advocacy and community partnerships. Dr. Rogers began his career as a community health worker in Baltimore, Maryland, working with underserved and vulnerable populations to promote and coordinate chronic disease prevention programs and to address SDOH. Dr. Rogers has previously served in various roles supporting local, state, and federal governments with implementation of core tenets of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. In addition, Dr. Rogers has led and collaborated across large integrated health systems to create and identify enterprise-wide strategies, processes, and resources that advance value-based care and population health goals. Dr. Rogers currently provides leadership, oversight, and direction in developing health policies and initiatives that are designed to advance public health promotion and prevention priorities. Dr. Rogers has authored peer-reviewed research publications, book chapters, and presented at national conferences and roundtable slash panel discussions all aimed at improving the health and well-being of underserved and vulnerable populations. We are thankful for each of you joining us today, and we are so eager to hear about your journey. So I'll start with one, well, question number one, which states, can you please tell us the story of your career path from your major in college, the journey to your current career, what were some of the obstacles along the way, and key factors, excuse me, contributing to your success? And we'll start with Dr. Queen. Thank you so much, Essence. I would say my journey, basically when I started college, I loved, I took AP Bio and AP Psych in high school. I loved them both. But if I had to pick, I loved science more. So I went ahead and majored in biology. But honestly, when I started, I didn't know, I really had no idea what I wanted to do with it. I knew I just liked science. And I had, in my sophomore year, I happened to read this book called The Hot Zone by Richard Preston. And that book's about an Ebola outbreak that happened in Reston, Virginia. So it was so exciting. I was super into it. I'm like, okay, I'm going to wear these, you know, biohazard spacesuits and go, you know, protect people against viruses. And from that point, I was kind of sold on the idea of microbiology. So I took a course of a professor at the time, Dr. Tatiana Roth, and she taught microbiology. It was an excellent class. I loved it. Um, at the time, there weren't that many resources in our department, but she was really creative. Um, made laboratories for us, um, just made it really exciting. And then my senior year, another professor joined Howard, I'm sorry, Coppin State, and um, Dr. Chimar Murdoch. And um, she taught medical microbiology. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna take this because it's kind of a different take on it. Took her course, it was awesome. It offered a completely different perspective. So from there, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna take this all the way through. Decided to go to grad school at Howard University. And from there, it was pretty much history. And since then, I've done um, infectious disease re research, cancer research. I've done work in public health with um, analyzing food outbreaks with foodborne viruses and bacteria. I've looked at um, biologic drug reviews with the FDA. And now I'm a director of microbiology and public health. And I manage programs basically testing the safety and effectiveness of antiseptic products. Challenges, I would say the biggest challenge is just um being creative because i was a commuter a non-traditional student which is what most coppin students tend to be so just being creative with finding ways to get to that next point all along the way thank you for that dr queen that was amazing next we will have mr foster yes man thank you so much for having me so <clears throat> Um, I actually started off, um, at my major at Coppin was uh, biology, um, because my intention was to do pre-med. Uh, and I, I began doing the research on what that would look like, like over the course of time, and decided I didn't want to be in school that long to begin my career. So I started looking at other options of how I could function in healthcare um, along the same scope of practice uh, um, as a physician. Um, and nurse practitioner was the best fit. Of course, in order to get there, you have to be a registered nurse. So um, completed the undergrad program um, at the Helene Food School of Nursing, uh, class of 2005. I actually started my nurse practitioner program the following year, but stopped because my business in an entirely different industry um, uh, was thriving um, and taking off and began to compete with school. 
Um, I'm still doing well in school, but I didn't want the business or school to suffer. Um, so I chose to, you know, um, follow the business track at that time. Um, after the recession, an opportunity um, presented itself in hospital leadership. And from there, uh, opportunities began pulling uh, from hospital administration. My mentors insisted that I get a master's degree. Um, so uh, I, I, did, I got the master's in hospital, um, <clears throat> hospital administration and business leadership um, at Washington Adventist University. And I decided that if I'm gonna be in school while I'm in the mood, um, I better finish my nurse practitioner now because my passion truly is um, directing and affecting patients' care, um, guiding their care and educating um, uh, at the bedside. So I came back home to Coppin, um, finished my nurse practitioner, and, uh, and here I am. So um, I've kind of explored both sides of the fence in terms of um, leadership administration and, uh, and direct patient care. Um, I would say probably one of my greatest obstacles, um, uh, uh, quite frankly, and I know, I know right now in, in this time we've been inundated with uh, social injustice, uh, one of my greatest obstacles were um, institutional racism, uh, social engineering, and the maldistribution of opportunity in healthcare administration leadership um, uh, and for healthcare providers. So. I'm happy to have overcome many of those things. Some of those things are still challenges, um, um, but you know, we work through them. Thank you so much, Mr. Foster, for that. My pleasure. Dr. Rogers? Yes, th thanks for having me. Um, I think like many young people growing up, Baltimore City, across our country, you know, doctor, lawyer was like the things to be. And so for me, it was becoming a doctor, I always had a passion for healthcare. Um, I knew of public health as I began and got into my, like my teenage years because my mother uh, has wor worked at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, um, Johns Hopkins uh, Nursing School. She works with researchers. So I kind of had an idea about that. And then I kind of transitioned to, to nursing. Um, and when I started at Coppin, I uh, started off as a nursing student, probably like many people out there. And um, it, it didn't drive well for me. It wasn't really a good fit. Um, so I took a little hiatus, a hiatus from school uh, for about a couple of years. And then when I came back to Coppin after about two years, that's when the health information management program was, 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 uh, was started. I think it was probably like in his first or second year. And, um, you know, I was half, I was in my, technically in my second or third year, I had all these credits. Um, I wanted to graduate. I still wanted to, uh, you know, get into healthcare, but more so on like the administration side. And so I, I, I continued in the health uh, information management uh, program. Um, I, had a, I had a groundbreaking internship um, in my in my last year at Coppin, right in the uh, community health center uh, that that Coppin runs there, and that internship really introduced me to health policy, and so I just fell in love with health policy. I fell in love with the idea that we can really, you know, create uh, these these policies or these 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 structures in, within healthcare. We can drive innovation, drive change by setting up, you know, these policies, these frameworks, these regulations in order to make improvements. I love the fact of, of researching um, information and how we can uh, pull these different groups of information together in order to come up with innovative ideas. I love creating ideas. Um, I love, I, I, so all of that involved, was involved in that internship. And so then I was like, huh, you know, I want to do this full time. Like I want to do health policy full time. So I began doing research on, you know, what it would take in order for me to really, you know, do health policy as part of my day to day. And I realized, hey, I need to get my master's in public health, and I need to specialize in health policy and management. And so that's what I did. I went in on, I got my MPH uh, from New York Medical College, and I specialized in health policy and management. 
And then I was like, huh, I really like the research part. Um, I can do this work. I mean, I just need to be trained in it. I, I, I need to really get some more, uh, get some more knowledge about how to, how to design a research study. I know I can write just as well as a, a person who publishes in, 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 in population health management, some of the other journals that I publish in, but I really need to get that research knowledge. So I went ahead and got my PhD um, in health sciences. And really, that's kind of really what birthed my passion for um, health policy and kind of how I got to be doing what I do now as the chief policy and strategy officer uh, for Montgomery County's Public Health Department. Um, what type of challenges have I had? Um, I think um, Dr. Queen shared it earlier. You know, I was a single dad going to Coppin, um, living in a community, commuting. And so, you know, that was a challenge, probably like many of you out there, you are single parents or parents trying to balance, trying to get an education. So time management really became the key. Um, and so when I learned time management, and it wasn't really until my second step at Coppin, it's like really when I started to really be successful and really excel in academics, because I knew how to manage my time. And, and, uh, and then I started reading my books. <laughs> And that's what really did it. When I started reading, um, that's what really kind of excelled me and, and towards the, the right path. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Rogers, and to all the panelists. Thank you so much for sharing your stories. Um, we're gonna go to the question number two. And it's, did you have any mentors that helped you along the way? If so, how did you, uh, how did you obtain a mentor? And again, we'll start with Dr. Queen. Yes, I had several mentors along the way. I um, previously mentioned Dr. Murdoch. And so something about her, she was really passionate about what she did. And I took another class of her histology and she used to take us on field trips. And I loved it. We went to the medical examiner's office, uh, went to downtown to see the pathology laboratory. And so it was great. And I kind of latched on to her. Like, this is something I always tell people. If you find a mentor or somebody who's doing something that you like that you really want to learn from latch on to them like don't do it in a, in a creepy way where they're uncomfortable and they're annoyed by you but like really just try to pick their brain you know ask about their past and eventually if they like you they'll take you in and they'll start to you know give you advice and write you recommendation letters and introduce you to people so she was a mentor to me um, another mentor was dr kenyatta cosby who was also a professor at Coppin State University. And um, he's a medical doctor also. And he was excellent mentor. He had a really good connection with the NIH. And so he used to get access for Coppin students to be able to go to their one week biotech courses. And so I went to several courses with him and just learned a ton. Like I never really had real laboratory experience. And it was great because I was a non-traditional student who had to work, often working two jobs while I was in school. So I, I couldn't take an internship. So like that was like a little quick way I could take a week off of work, get um, an opportunity to learn from scientists that are world renowned. And um, because of some of those opportunities, it kind of gave me a leg up when I went to apply to graduate school. And um, I, I still stand by those are the things that helped me get in because, you know, sometimes you're coming from a situation where you don't have that opportunity to do that background work it's hard to get seen. And so like those little things on my resume were what helped me help make me visible. I have other mentors around the way from graduate school. Um, one that really took my took me under his wing was when I graduated from my PhD program. I did, uh, I worked for a short time for a nonprofit called Noblis. And there um, I did work with um, biodefense, like biological warfare agents. But the person who brought me in, he was a graduate from my department. And he told me, he went to, um, he's kind of in a circumstance where he feels like he doesn't want to leave anybody behind to have to go the route that he went to get to where he is and it was an excellent road but he said it just took him so long to get where he is and if he can help somebody under him get there 10 10 times faster then that's what he's going to do and to this day like i still look up to him he works for um, nasa jpl his name's dr alvin smith he's awesome and like those are why my major overarching mentors, and they made a huge difference in my success. Thank you, Dr. All right, uh, Mr. Foster. Yes, ma'am. Um, I most definitely had several mentors. Um, 
to name a few, Dr. Denise Wadis Daniels, uh, professor um, at Coppin State, um, Dr. Marcella Copes, uh, who was the dean at Coppin State at the time, uh, uh, for the time that I was there, um, Dr. Michael Zala Kaffa, um, uh, Dr. Ronnie Boyd is a, uh, was a professor in, uh, in the School of Science. Um, uh, Dr. Sam Ross was CEO uh, uh, and regional um, COO of uh, Bonsa Corps Medical System. So I had several, several uh, mentors um, that were integral to my success um, that saw in potential and favor where I didn't. Um, I have always been a major proponent of the fact that any level of success that we achieve is not on our own, um, but with the aid, the push, the intervention of those key people, um, mentors and partners along the way, um, you know, it's impossible to, to achieve uh, success alone. Uh, and this should never be taken for granted. Uh, mentors can be sought uh, by seeking a particular individual uh, who's, who's where you would like to be or has a particular um, uh, expertise or set of tools to get you to where you want to go. Um, and you simply ask. Um, again, like Dr. Queen said, you don't have to be creepy about it. You don't have to harass them. Um, but posing the, just posing the question uh, very oftentimes is enough because believe it or not, people want to give back. People want to um, uh, want to help. Um, so, uh, uh, and, and that can even be done through asking for an introduction on your behalf from someone who you know is close to them. So just don't be shy about it. Um, you know, make sure you take control of of, of, uh, of your success in that way. And then sometimes mentors choose you um, as well. They see something in you that they can assist with in your growth or cultivate or contribute to. Um, uh, so sometimes your mentor will seek you out and just be receptive to that. Uh, be receptive to someone being interested in your, in your future and your success. Essence, are you frozen? Essence, I'm not sure if you you are you might be frozen or <laughs> I'm not sure if you're talking, but if, if, okay. I don't know if you want me to answer the question. Uh, yes. I think Mr. Mr. Foster stole my thunder because may, maybe there's one good mentor in in Baltimore, which is Dr. Samuel Ross, uh, which is which was also. Um, my, my mentor, and I'll tell a little bit story about how I uh, met him. Um, and I've also had spiritual mentors. Me being a man of faith, uh, my pastor is a is a very important mentor for me. He he stresses the importance of education, which is really a driving factor behind uh, me wanting to ensure that I become educated. Uh, I think Coppin has been good to me. I, I can recall I was the uh, president of the. Student Health Information Management Association, and it was fairly new at the time. And my professor, Professor um, Calhoun, has also, who has also been a good mentor to me, also um, asked me if I wanted to go. Asked me to go present on the program to the Board of Regents uh, for Coppin State University. And Dr. Sam Ross was on the Board of Regents at that time. And after I, I finished presenting, I'm uh, talking about the program. Uh, Dr. Ross walked up to me. He gave me his business card. He was like, I want to get you plugged in. He said, he said, give me a call, email me. And, and so I emailed him. And in that email, uh, he asked me, uh, we set up a breakfast meeting. And so we went out. And so he's the CEO of Bon He was the CEO of Bon School Hospital. Now he's his, uh, the chief community health officer with Bon School Mercy Health. So we went out to breakfast. Uh, we, we chatted, we had a conversation um, in a follow-up email and my thanking him, you know, for, for, for extending me uh, the opportunity to go out to breakfast with him to kind of talk about healthcare career opportunities. I asked him to mentor me and he, and he agreed. And so uh, it's been, it's been probably over 10, 15, it's been about 12 years. Um, since, since, since Dr. Ross ha has, been, has been my mentor. And so um, he has guided me as far as 
um, the healthcare, uh, my healthcare career. Uh, he has guided me as far as what, you know, making my, my next decisions as far as what jobs to take. Um, he has given me insight into some of the latest uh, knowledge with respect to um, healthcare operations or healthcare administration or something we talk about to this day, which is uh, population health value-based care. Um, he, have, he has given me guidance as far as um, my personal life and, and, and family and faith. And so, you know, you want to you wanna definitely look for a mentor or someone who can, uh, that, that one person may not be able to speak to all areas of your life, but make sure that you have someone uh, within all of those areas in your life that are important. And for me, it's, 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 uh, it, it's my faith, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's health care, and, and it's also my family. And so uh, still to this day, we, 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 we make sure that we connect um, at, least, at least twice a year, um, go out, well, it's, we're in COVID now, so it's more virtual, but we want to make sure we go out to breakfast or lunch and just have a conversation. Um, so, so those things are important. So, if, if I could piggyback on on Dr. Rogers, so um, you know, I'm, I'm very familiar with Dr. Ross's uh, 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 Miss Shirley's uh, breakfast. Uh, oh yes, <laughs> uh, yeah, we, that's his favorite spot, and we we do that quite often. But um, um, just just to kind of piggyback on what you were saying and kind of what I was saying earlier, Dr. Ross is one of the mentors. I simply walked up to him and asked. Um, yeah. Uh, so he um, he was pointed out to me by um, a, coll a colleague of mine who was the CEO at one of the, the health systems I worked for, um, and uh, he he, he kind of put the bug in my head that Dr. Ross would likely be receptive to that, and that the conversation lasted just a couple minutes, but that spawned a relationship that has you know the last maybe seven eight years, um, and, and and Dr. Ross truly has a passion. For, for bringing folks along. So um, I, I think that's a, I think Dr. Ross and, and your story is a key example. You can, you can literally just walk up to someone and ask um, uh, and, and, you know, be surprised what you might find. Thank you for that panelist. Um, the next question I'll ask is how can networking either in person or digital help in the transition from college to career? And again, Dr. Queens, beginning with you. Well, networking is so important. I feel like a good amount of opportunities <sighs> I've acquired over time are through networking. Um, basically, when you go online and you apply for these jobs, you know, you're just one of X amount of people who are going and applying for these same jobs. And sometimes it takes building that extra, taking that extra step to build those relationships that make a big difference in um, the opportunities that you come across. Like for example, when I was in, when I graduated, um, when I still had my connection with Dr. Cosby and he was attending those um, NIH courses, I um, was chatting with one of the instructors during the class and this is literally in my first year of grad school. I had no summer plans. I didn't have a research project yet. And um, one of the professors in the, um, well, one of the, the laboratory scientists in the course, he asked us, you know, what's missing here? And I just said, oh, the control is missing. And he's like, oh, talk to me. And I'm like, okay. So I talked to him. And then after the class, he's like, you know what? You're pretty sharp. He said, you should talk to my wife. And his wife was uh, a research scientist at Walter Reed's Army Institute of Research. And literally just like that, I sent her an email and that summer, I had an internship there doing malaria research. So it was, it was awesome. So like, it, it's so important to just talk to people and reach out to them because you never know what type of opportunity they have. I didn't have to go online to apply. There were all these special loopholes I had to go through. I just talked to someone. And um, a shameless plug, um, me and two other women scientists were actually starting something for networking and other opportunities for black students and professionals in STEM and it's called STEMpire. So if you follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Stempire Inc, um, stay tuned, we'll be launching soon and you'll get more info on that. Sounds amazing, thank you, Dr. Queen. Uh, Mr. Rogers, well, excuse me, I went out of order, Doc, uh, Mr. Foster. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, um, you know, I'll, I'll keep this one short. Um, networking is key. I mean, again, there's no success on your own. Um, 
So um, make sure that you, you get out there. And, and again, don't be shy. You know, um, make sure that you get out there. You seek individuals that are in, in the field that you want to be in, the places that you want to go, and the things that you have a passion for. Um, uh, get close to those individuals. And um, um, again, a, a big key of that is not just you getting close to others, but being receptive to others getting close to you. That can be a mentor, that could be someone else attempting to um, network, so on and so forth, because you never know um, how you may be able to help someone else. Um, uh, and these things just, you know, these things come full circle. So networking is definitely key. Thank you. Um, now moving on to Dr. Rogers. Um, I would say that every job in healthcare that I have had, except the one that I'm in now, is a result of networking. Like I knew somebody, <laughs> like I, I networked. And so um, it, it's very important and, and sources of um, networking can be your professors. I know within, you know, like the health information management program, very good about and very proactive about networking, making sure that students are connected with other professionals. So talking to your professors about networking opportunities, um, uh, associations within, within your specific um, field, like for, for me, it's American Public Health Association. I remember I went to the American Public Health Association uh, meeting and, um, in, in New Orleans and was down there networking, networking end up, you know, getting a job and, and, and started that job, I think probably, I don't know, the meeting was maybe like in November, so I probably started the job like two months later. It was all because of networking. And it wasn't networking at one of the um, exhibits in a large hall, but it was networking on the side, you know, talking to someone on the side um, about, about, about health policy, about the Affordable Care Act. And, and, and they were impressed with what I had to share. Um, and so, um, uh, also, your mentors can also introduce you to various different networks. So, so there's there's sources of, of, of networking, but you know, networking is is key, and uh, it will definitely help you to 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 progress in, in your career and kind of get where you want to be. And can I piggyback on Dr. Rogers real fast? I just want to emphasize keeping your LinkedIn profiles updated because you might not necessarily always be actively talking to people, but that's a quick way to find people that may be in a field that you're interested in. But my current position with the American Cleaning Institute, they found me through there. They saw what I had on my profile and thought that maybe I'd be a good fit for what they were looking for. And then that's how the whole interview process started. So it works. Thank you for that. Um, so the next question I'll ask for the panelists is, um, what should students do now to be successful in the future? And Dr. Okay. So what should students do to be successful in the future? I would start to say with, I would say um, the number one thing I can suggest is, I imagine everyone who's watching this right now is a very smart person. There are a lot of smart people in this world, but what helps us navigate and get into these opportunities and positions, not just how smart we are, but how we're able to relate to people, how we can communicate the work that we do, um, how personable you are. It makes a big difference in the partnerships that you form if you're, if you're mindful about that. Just that whole, what's that old saying, you get more flies with honey. like that's the type of person you want to be when you go out into the world. You have plenty of opportunities, I guess, to be cut through if, it, if it's absolutely necessary, but that's, that's not how you make it through here and, and make it a lasting um, presence in this world. And that's something people should keep in mind as they push through. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Foster? So um, a, a couple of things I would say is the first thing is, you know, focus now. Um, Dr. Rogers mentioned a few minutes ago about how his second stint was much more successful than his first, becoming organized, time management. Um, try to start focusing on those things now. Um, 
so that you know you can you can build a good foundation and platform um, platform for your success. Um, truly believe and understand that there are no limitations. Um, I think I think all the panelists here. I've heard Dr. Queen mention some things. I've heard Dr. Rogers mention some things. As soon as you find out what's required to do what you have to do, just do it. Just put your head down, find out the information, find out what's required, and do it. There's nothing too hard. So, um, uh, um, you know, understand that there are no limitations. Believe in yourself, and and probably lastly, don't take um, don't take relationships with your peers and mentors for granted. You know, you definitely want to cultivate those, um, and not just necessarily for personal gain. You want to be genuine about it. Um, uh, because one, as Dr. Queen said, you know, you want to be relatable to people. Um, you want to be personable to people. Um, so be genuine about, about, about cultivating those relationships, not taking them for granted. Um, uh, don't let your desire for success be completely self-serving. You know, elevate and give back as well. Thank you, Mr. Foster. I'm Dr. Rogers. Yeah, I, I, I would probably say three, three quick things. One is um, begin developing emotional intelligence. Um, emotional intelligence, social, they call them soft skills. Um, my mentor, Dr. Ross, told me once, um, and I'm saying this to everybody in 100, so people got to want to work around you. If people don't want to work with you, Nobody want to work with a nasty colleague. Nobody wants to work with somebody that they can't get along with. And so, and Dr. Ross once told me, he said, I hire people for what they know. I hire people because of their technical skills for what they know. But I fire people because of their behavior. People get fired because of their behavior. We can always find somebody with a PhD with good technical skills. But if people don't want to work with you, so make sure you begin to develop your character. I think I think that that's essential. I would also say, find begin to really find your your expertise. You you read essence all of our bios, and if the audience heard from our bios, we all have specific expertise, specific problems that we want to solve. For me, mine is social in terms of health, addressing food insecurity, those connections between overall health outcomes and some of the social issues that people experience. So my passion is about chronic diseases or self-management type two diabetes. So find out exactly what you wanna do and really begin to really Google information about that, um, begin to learn about that, learn outside of the classroom. So read in different literature, um, you know, going on to, for example, for me, it'll be like on the, the Centers for Disease Control website, to just read some, some real world scenarios as to what's going on within that particular um, um, area in which you would like to study because, you know, as you transition into your interviews, you'll be able to use some of that language, some of that knowledge to frame some of your responses to, to some of the questions in light of uh, what the job is asking you to do or in light of your, your academic training or your previous experience. So, I would kind of say those two things are something that you want to begin to really prepare yourself for to be successful. Thank you, panelists. Um, I believe I heard Mr. Foster mention this about peer relationships. So I'll ask that question. Um, so how important are peer-to-peer -peer rela um, relationships in, in obtaining goals? They're very important. I think sometimes I've, I, I've interacted with different institutions while I was coming through school. And I would say I've interacted with schools and schools with students who really want to work together and help each other through. Like if you're coming in the same department, you're in the same graduating year, you know, those are the people you kind of click up with, study for exams and things like that. But not just that, we kind of feed off of each other like, oh, I heard about this opportunity. You should apply for this too. At least one of us is going to get it. You know, things like that. You know, those are important. But I've also both worked for and uh, went to academic institutions for other opportunities where I saw that the students were extremely competitive. It was all about stepping on somebody's shoulders, head, neck, whatever it took to be seen. 
And I absolutely hate that. And I hate that value system. I think it's really important to build connections with your peers because once you graduate, once you go off into the world, one day you might need a, you know, a neurologist or, you know, a, a statistician. And you're like, oh yeah, well, you know, such and such and such was in my program. You know, you can call them. You'll always have that that connection. And that makes a huge difference. And not just in an academic setting, but even in the workplace. Like your coworkers are your peers and it's important to collaborate with them, build good relationships. You know, someone needs help with something, step up and offer that and they'll do the same. Thank you, Dr. Queen. Uh, Mr. Foster? Yeah, you know, <clears throat> I, I may sound a little bit like a broken record here, but um, not, none of our success, not one of us on this panel, no individual that's successful is successful on their own. Um, and uh, I started undergrad at Coppin 20 years ago. And um, my peers in undergrad, we're still very close friends today. Uh, we've gotten each other's jobs. We've protected each other in jobs. Uh, we've elevated each other. So, uh, and you will gain peers along the way. You'll, you'll meet people, as Dr. Queen said, you'll meet people when you get to new institutions, when you get to new programs. Um, You'll, you'll meet, network, and, and, and build and cultivate relationships with, with different people, and they will become your peers. Um, and then they, those people will be integral in your future. You'll run into someone five, 10 years down the road um, uh, that you need a resource for, um, you need a resource from that needs you. Um, and you guys will, will be able to serve each other in that way. Um, and it, 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 you know, it becomes, Dr. Rogers mentioned a little while ago about how, um, uh, uh, I think this was Dr. Queen as well, mentioned a, a little while ago about how all of their jobs um, came from uh, networking or came from someone that they knew as opposed to necessarily their educational background or, or, or whatever they wrote down in the application. Um, and, you know, it becomes, you, some of your success becomes about the relationship. It doesn't become about what you can do. You know, some of your success is, is, is based in, that's my best friend, or um, th that's, the, that's the person who, who I made sure got to school every day, or who I made sure woke up on time to take that test, or who I made sure was at the meeting on time. And, and those people don't forget that. So um, just peer-to-peer -peer relationships are integral. I mean, you have to you have to have it. Again, don't take it for granted. And um, some people, you know, some of us are, are socially challenged. And, and Dr. Rogers talked about emotional and social intelligence, realizing that, that you, you are that person that may be an introvert, may not want to network all the time, may not want to go out all the time, may not want a new friend, may not want a new phone number, may not want to talk tonight. And just being receptive to those things um, and, and realizing the space that you're in and trying to be a little more open um, will definitely change the dynamic of, of your success. Thank you. Dr. Rogers? Yeah, I guess I'll just kind of extend that a little bit. Uh, so peer-to-peer -peer relationships, working, being able to work well with others, develop relationships, not only in the classroom is important. Uh, I still have friends to this day, people that I talk to that I uh, went to copy with, but on the work in the workplace. So when I hire somebody, again, I guess it kind of goes back to my previous statement. I'm not only looking for technical skills, but I'm looking for somebody that can fit in well relationally. And, and you can get that vibe once you when you interview somebody for an hour long, you begin to get in the feel. Of how 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 well will they work with myself? How well will they work with other team members? Um, because a, 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 a good, solid, strong peer-to-peer -peer relationship in the workplace, uh, it, it, it improves um, job satisfaction, right? It, it improves, you know, productivity across the department or within the team. Um, it, it allows um, us as peers to really support each other and to bolster each other and to really drive for results. And so, you know, developing a healthy, strong peer peer relationship is, is, is very important and something that you want to kind of keep in mind. And I guess it goes back to, again, 
to that emotional intelligence, you know, making sure that you present well, um, you know, um, socially, emotionally, and things like that. Thank you so much for your responses um, and the ones, the previous responses as well. We are definitely getting a lot of helpful information. Um, as we continue forward, the next question is, can you speak on the importance of giving back or paying it forward? I think giving it back or paying it forward is one of the utmost important things that anyone could ever do. Because just as we speak about mentors and how impactful they are in your lives, imagine if these people never were there for you. Like, if people are there for you, then as you excel and move forward in life, then you need to be there for, for the people that are coming in behind you. It should be a continuous cycle. It should never stop. And as long as you keep that at the, the core of your values, then I think just overall you'll have self-satisfaction and then you'll always be impacting someone's life positively. Yeah, um, to, to piggyback on what, what Dr. Queen um, just mentioned and um, uh, kind of almost saying uh, something very similar, you know, giving back, paying it forward, that is one of the, the, the key aspects truly to your personal success. Um, it's so important that we take care of each other. So important that we take care of each other, um, provide and create opportunities for each other because in, in, in many instances, no one else will. So, um, I, I, you know, I'll be short on that one, but I just, it's, it's, it's not many words to, to, to state that it is so, so important um, that we give back, that we pay it forward, um, that we look out for, uh, for others that are trying to come our way, um, um, uh, just just the personal satisfaction of someone else's success uh, will, will will elevate you for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I echo you know what what the other panelists have said. Um, giving back is, is essential. I mean, I see this as an opportunity. What I'm doing right now is a, as, as an opportunity to give back. And so, so there, there are various uh, ways in which you know we can we can give back, uh, no matter what what level you are within your organization. I, I'm at a level now within within my career within my organization where one way that I like to give back is through internships. So I want to find students who I can bring into to to my organization to my program, and to give them a a meaningful internship so that. When they leave, when they leave from my organization, they will have some meaningful responsibilities on their resume, so that when that employer, when they interview that employer, they have some skills and they can contribute day one. Uh, because I myself had strategic internships throughout my kind of early uh, 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 academic life, early in my career, and all of my internships. Um, I had, um, it, it was it was an opportunity for me to grow. It was an opportunity for me to just not go in and, and file papers or answer some phones. I mean, I was doing real tasks. I mean, I was, man I, was, I was managing projects. I was delivering results. And so I'm always looking for students who uh, I can pull in, especially minority students, and really, you know, give them some meaningful work through an internship. And I see that as my way of being able to, to give back, to help them to, to advance in their career. And I'm always asking students like, you know, where do you see yourself in five years? So when it comes to public health, I'm like, what do you, what do you want to do? Because I want to, if I can identify exactly what they want to do, I can create a project for them that gives them some experience in order to help them to get there. And so, and so that's some ways in, in, in which I, it's one way in which I, I try to give back. Thank you so much. Um, I believe some of you, uh, well, actually all three of you touched on this kind of in your own personal journeys. Um, but the question is, do you recommend any career readiness workshops, books, programs, or resources? 
I think I'll piggyback on what um, Dr. Rogers mentioned earlier about taking soft skills courses. I think that's very important to make sure you have that under your belt. But I would say whatever your spe your specialty is, um, look into, if you're not already a student member, look into becoming student members of these professional associations. Like for example, I'm a part of the American Society for Microbiology and they have some really good conferences. They even have one that's coming up in November called Abracams, and that's that um, annual biomedical research conference for minority students. And they specifically seek out these students to, to present their research and then other students will come to the conference, albeit this year is virtual, but you get to see all this research that's happening and just get an opportunity to be exposed to people that look like you in the sciences. So I would say any field you're interested in, join a professional association. Usually student memberships are um, really low cost or sometimes they have opportunities for you to join for free. Yeah, so definitely a piggyback on, on um, what, what Dr. Queen stated. Um, <clears throat> definitely joining, um, specifying what is in your field and then joining those, uh, those organizations. Me, myself, um, I'm a member of the American Association of Nurse Practitioners. I'm a member of the American Nursing Association. Um, I'm a member of the National Association of Health Service Executives. Um, and, and joining those, uh, uh, you know, different professional memberships, um, attending their conferences, um, attending conferences within those, uh, within your field is huge because those, those conferences will, will, garner resources that you didn't even imagine, you know, uh, or couldn't even imagine were, were available. And then they'll do other things for you. They kind of go right in line with many of the things that we talked about today. They'll provide networking opportunities. They'll provide um, um, uh, other resources and opportunities um, to help you grow and, and, and add to your success. So definitely I, I would begin with, um, I would begin with joining those, uh, those uh, organizations. I mean, I guess I, I can echo the same thing that, that Dr. Queen and, and, and Mr. Foster said. I'll just add one additional reason why you should join those uh, professional associations in your particular field as a student. Uh, you should put them on your resume because if, 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 you are, if you are a new graduate looking for a job and I, I get your resume and I see that you have had meaningful internships I see that you are affiliated with the with with the uh, associations in in our particular field, which could be the American Public Health Association. That says to me that that, that you are connected to some of the latest uh, cutting edge knowledge. That means to me that shows to me that you are willing to to go out. You know where to go get information. You know how to you know how to network. Um, you know how to do community engagement. You know how to develop relationships because all of these resources are embedded within such um, type of organization. So uh, I, more reason to, 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 to take advantage of, of, those types of, um, of those types of resources. Thank you so much, panelists. You are doing amazing and giving very helpful responses. Um, and just thank you so much for your individual roles and in making this event um, so successful. Um, as we prepare to close, I do want to ask you all just to take a moment to give any um, the most important advice you want to share, any last um, any last words that you have, just anything to kind of conclude what you've um, been giving us and just kind of bring it to a conclusion. I would say um, two things. Well, one thing I want to do, I want to kind of piggyback on something that Mr. Foster mentioned earlier about um, being an introvert. I, by nature, am one of the biggest introverts. Like, I used to be super quiet, didn't really talk. Nobody knew I had a voice. But, you know, I was a cool person. But I realized, you know, if I ever wanted to grow and do the things that I wanted to do, then I had to force myself to step out of my comfort zone. And I just felt compelled to say that because I don't want anybody who's an introvert watching, like, oh, I can't go to these conferences. I don't want to sit here and network with people. I can't do that. Like, you can do it. You just have to push yourself to be uncomfortable and do it. And now I'm like almost the exact opposite of what I used to be. But, you know, you just have to push those boundaries. So there are no limitations. And outside of that, I say 
never put yourself into a box. Like even me, I'm a microbiologist. It doesn't mean I can only do microbiology. There's a million things I can do and still go home as a microbiologist at the end of the night. So don't limit yourself and that will open a world of opportunities for you. Yep, so for me, just um, um, just some of the things that I mentioned earlier. Um, first, first start with, with knowing that there are absolutely no limitations. And I know that sounds cliche, but it's the absolute truth. There are no limitations. Like if there's something that, that you set your mind that you want to do, um, just find out what it takes and do it. Um, um, <clears throat> so I, I would definitely lead with that. Um, I think Dr. Queen uh, mentioned something that's very key just now, and don't put yourself in a box. Um, you know, there are so many things that you can do with what you have um, uh, and expound on it. You can even create, um, which is something that we, you know, uh, um, which is something that we excel at. So you can create something, a lane, all your own uh, that the world truly needs. So don't put yourself in a box and um and definitely definitely move move with the mindset that there are no limitations all i have to do is take the steps i i'm, I'm just going to echo what what i said earlier um emotional intelligence like it's just so important um you know i i'm at the position again in my career now where you know i promote people or I hire people or I fire people. If I want to promote you to a higher level, then I got to be able to work with you. Like, I got to be, we got to get along. <laughs> I got to want to be able to, to have a good, a good, a nice conversation with you. I got to want to be around you, no matter how much skill you got. Because if, 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 you don't, if I can't get along with you or you can't get along with this other person, I don't care how much, and, and I'm not trying to, you know, throw shade on what they say, but I don't know how much you create. I don't care how much you visualize yourself. I don't care how much you, how many degrees you got. But if I pick up that phone and I call one of your previous employers for a reference and they tell me you're a nasty person, you ain't getting that job. You, you, you are not going to get that job. And so just making sure that you are self-aware at all times, you know, making sure that you're able to self-manage yourself, uh, making sure that you know how to deal effectively in relationships, making sure that you understand how to communicate well, uh, demonstrate patience and understanding, uh, making sure that you are able to, 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 to use the right words in the right context so it don't offend individuals. You know, all these things are important when we talk about emotional intelligence and being able to um, progress and advance, you know, in your career and, and being able to, to, to develop those peer-to-peer -peer relationships, being able to network, all those things we've kind of talked about up until this point, I see hinges upon um, social skills or, or, or effective relationships that we have with individuals in our place of work. That will take, because I can teach you, I can teach you how to do research. I can teach you how to develop a, a process improvement. I can teach you how to do evaluation, but I can't teach you how to not be nasty. That's something that's something that gotta come from within. And so, and so so that's why I so that's why it's so so important that you develop those emotional intelligence skills. Thank you so much. Um, so I don't see any questions. Um, here. So I guess we can come to a conclusion. Um, again, thank you so much, panelists, um, Dr. Queen, Mr. Foster, and Dr. Rogers. Thank you so much for being here and taking the time to share um, everything that you had, um, your specific and individual journeys, um, great advice, recommendations. It has all been so great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would like to acknowledge the attendees. Thank you for being here, um, my fellow peers. Thank you um, so much for taking this time. Um, I know it's kind of hard to get us to come out for things, but um, great job. Thank you for being here. Um, and remember what we learned 
um, those key takeaways. Just make sure you do take note of those. Continue um, to use the, the advice that was given today in your professional and educational careers. Um, and then I would definitely like to take a moment to recognize and acknowledge the Office of Alumni Engagement and the University Academic Advising Center for hosting this event. It has been amazing. It has been wonderful. Thank you so much for all the work you all have put into this um, and in creating this amazing event. So thank you. And if anyone wants to, you know, chime in, <laughs> that's all I have for tonight. And thank you for allowing me to be here to moderate. I do appreciate the opportunity and it has been amazing. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here tonight. Love this evening. <laughs> thank you.